Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. As children, brothers Robert and Vincent Gardino began to take an interest in historical people when their dad started bringing home autographs from famous patrons at the New York City restaurant where he worked as a waiter. The two boys then took it upon themselves to expand their collection of autographs by using resources at the public library to obtain addresses of other notable people, such as politicians, celebrities, and sports figures. They wrote to these people, and to their surprise, many responded and their collection grew. This early interest in collecting autographs prompted the Gardino brothers as adults to connect with historical figures by searching for their final resting places so they could pay their respects and connect with history. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, we will be speaking with Robert and Vincent Gardino about their recently released book, Grave Trippers, History at Our Feet, which documents the stories of noted historical personalities, along with some fun facts and specific directions to their final resting places, so that others can be grave trippers too. I'd now like to welcome Robert and Vincent Gardino to our show. Welcome, guys. Morning, James. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Great being here, James. Well, I've just finished your book, Grave Trippers, History at Our Feet. And dare I say that this book is a lot of fun. <laughs> it's about cemeteries. <laughs> so I might sound a little bit weird, but I really, really loved your book. It was just fantastic. Thank you very much. What I particularly enjoyed about it was it's a fairly short book but it is packed with information. It talks about the cemeteries themselves, the specific graves that you found, also the person who's in the grave and who that person was. And then you've included fun facts about that person, which is kind of cool. It's something you can take away, information you've got. And then it gives you something else, directions on how to go visit that grave yourself. So it's a great companion to somebody who may want to go out on a, an adventure. You say you're visiting someplace historic and you come across this historic cemetery and you want to find a grave and you don't want to spend all afternoon looking for the grave, right? Correct. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. Where our directions are precise. They are. And it's certainly going to be a traveling companion of mine because I love going to historic spots. Before we start talking about some of the interesting people and places in your book, I want to talk a little bit about the authors, that being you guys. <laughs> so, Robert, can you give us your background, your early days, and how did you get interested in history in general? Well, uh, we're both born and raised in New York City, we were raised on the west side of Manhattan, the infamous Hell's Kitchen area. And Vincent and I, we, we, we've both been interested by history. And it started when our father, who was a waiter at a famed celebrity haunt, it was the name of the restaurant was called Danny's Hideaway. Celebrities would go there and our father would bring us home the autographs of some of the famous people. So uh, that fascinated us and that led us into wanting to read more about the individual. And that was sort of the, the pathway to both of us being history buffs. Good. Vincent, did you want to add to that? Well, I do want to add uh, my father's name. He had a very lyrical name, Nino Gardino. How about that, huh? <laughs> that rolls off the tongue. Yes, and uh, he had gotten a lot of autographs for us and uh, had doubted one time that he knew, he kept telling me he knew Billy Martin, the manager of the Yankees. I said, you don't know him. And lo and behold, there was this all sports dinner at the New York Athletic Club, and there was a line of people getting autographs, and I go to Billy Martin. I said, uh, he said you, who do you want me to make it out to? I said, could you make it out to my father, Nino? And he looked at me and says, Nino? He said, the waiter at Danny's Hideaway? I said, yes. I said, he's my father. And I was like, I came home and I said, look. He said, he said I told you I know him. Uh, anyway, you know, I was, uh, I've always been a history buff. I had a history major in college. And uh, despite that, I got into the uh, broadcast sales uh, area. 
for my career. I, I worked at uh, numerous radio stations, WABC, when it was music radio, not what it is today, uh, WOR, WNYC, WQXR, the ABC radio network, and ended my career at Strauss News in print, believe it or not. And I also had a brief sojourn at uh, CNBC, all in sales management roles. But I, I always had a love of history from day one. And Robert and I have, I think, the unique distinction. I don't know if there's any two brothers that have the complete set of presidential autographs. So I've got my set and Robert has his set. So uh, our love of history has been with us all our lives. And um, this book was a labor of love. And uh, we hope to turn people on to uh, to our, our passion. It's like an introduction to our hobby. But uh, Robert's right. You know, we, we grew up in Hell's Kitchen. Uh, when it was Hell's Kitchen, not a nice place. It's gentrified today and in the shadow of Times Square. But now we've upgraded. <laughs> We're in Lincoln Center and uh, loving where we are. Our entire universe is uh, one mile. We grew up on 48th Street. Now we're on 68th Street. So, <laughs> Wow. So you really are city people then. Yeah, it can't get more New through York than through, us. Through and through, yes. Yeah. Through and through. Now, Robert, your career, didn't you go into a career in finance? In banking. I, uh, most of my working career was at, I started at the old Manufacturers Hanover Trust Bank. Then that became Chemical. Then that became Chase Manhattan. And today it's now J.P. Morgan Chase. So I ended my career in 2013 after, after so many years in banking. I retired on disability. I have Parkinson's disease. Maybe you can tell from, from the funny movements that I'm making. But uh, I do not let the Parkinson's hold me back. I, uh, I will not surrender to any dis- disability. I will pursue those subjects which I find interesting and give me enjoyment. And that is one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because we have this love of history. And I, this was a labor of love, this book, I would say. Fantastic. I, I'm so glad to hear that. That's very encouraging to hear that. Because there's a lot of people, there's things that could people could say that stands between them and what they want to do. But the fact that you're doing this and This book is just great. I'm so glad that you guys have put this book together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Robert's really the author. Uh, I was like the executive producer. I found the publisher and uh, coordinated the photos and uh, and the directions of the grade. But Robert is really the bona fide author. Uh, You did a lot of the proofreading and everything. You did the grunt work. (laughs) Yes. There you go. Very well put. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You made it work. Hey, two brothers getting along that long. Yes, um, trust me, we have our moment. He, yeah, him, with me, him with me and uh, me with him. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. So, Vincent, when and where did your love of history, which came from obviously these autographs from famous people, and let's face it, history is about people, right? Presidents, uh, celebrities, whatever, it all sort of merges into history. When did, when did this interest sort of shift to... Is it in grave sites, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, in 1995, uh, Robert and I uh, uh, made a trip to Washington, D.C., you know, just a typical tourist uh, going to the museums. But we wanted to go to Arlington Cemetery to pay our respects to uh, the gravesite of uh, President Kennedy. And we both remember uh, when he was shot that weekend. And it was it was pretty traumatic. And we wanted to go pay our respects. So we, we go to Arlington. Our first stop was President Kennedy's grave. And alongside was Robert Kennedy. Remember what happened, you know, when he got killed. But we found out uh, that there were so many other famous people there. Uh, notably, another president of the United States, William Howard Taft. Mm-hmm. A distinction of being not only president but Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And we, you know, we walked around and we go like, "Wow, this is pretty cool." You know, we can we can pay our respects to these people, and that's what it is. It's paying respect. Uh, there's nothing macabre or uh, sinister about it, but it was just, you know, th- this is where they are. And um, that ignited our interest. And subsequently, anytime we, we found ourselves in, a, in another city or even the New York metro area, we'd go to cemeteries and go visit, try and locate the grave sites of people that we had a, uh, an admiration for. I'll give you a great example of uh, New York City, uh, Woodlawn Cemetery, uh, which is one of our favorite spots and highlighted in our book, Fiorella LaGuardia, the, the Little Flower, probably the most famous mayor uh, of New York City. But we, we went to see his grave site. So that visit to Arlington in 1995, initially just to pay our respects to President Kennedy, 
uh, was the launching pad for uh, our interest in pursuing other people. Yeah, uh, Robert, did you want to add to that? My brother is correct. Our interest in the grays is not, we're not morbid people. We're not into the paranormal. We're certainly not trying to uh, conjure up spirits. I'll add this. We will not go to a cemetery that has no historic people or... or... Yeah, we're kind of picky. And a lot of people say, have you been in this cemetery? And I'm like, no, there's nobody in there. I'm sorry. So, so, so <laughs> we, have... we only go to places where there's famous people, like two or three of them too, you know. <laughs> so so, so we're, we're not, this is not a morbid fascination. We don't dwell so much on death. If there's no one that interests us, there's no notable person in a cemetery... We don't have any interest in that cemetery. Well, let me give you a quick aside. One of the things we enjoy doing as grave trippers, and I think the name is uh, very appropriate, uh, because you, you go with who you want to see, okay? You have a list, and every cemetery that we've been to always has a, has a list of all the luminaries in the cemetery. And, but when you're going around, you know, you trip over graves. I'll give you an example. The very, one of the very first ones we, we, we did, we were in Mount Albert Cemetery in Boston, and we were looking for the grave of Charles Sumner, uh, who was the abolitionist senator who got caned, believe it or not, in the Senate. Anyway, we were walking down this path, and I see the headstone of Francis Parkman. And Francis Parkman was a very famous uh, 19th century author, and he uh, authored uh, The Oregon Trail, a very famous book, uh, Wolf and Montcalm. But there he was. We were just walking down on our way to see where Sumner was. And, and he's not on the map. He was not listed as a luminary at uh, Mount Auburn. Even in our recent visit uh, out of the West Coast, uh, we went out to see a whole bunch of cemeteries about a year ago today. Believe it or not, we were looking for um, Valley Harper of uh, a Rota fame and Mary Tyler Moore fame. And we couldn't find it. But walking around, I looked at Robert. I said, look, hey, Faye Ray. You know, Faye Ray was at our feet. And he had just bought, he had just gotten, acquired her autograph photo, I think about a year ago. But um, that's the fun of it. You run into people, even in Père Lachaise Cemetery with my late wife in Paris, we were looking for Sarah Bernhardt, walking, walking, walking. And we, we, by the way, we finally gave up. It was too hot. But in, in our travels, trying to find Sarah Bernhardt, uh, Ginny and I uh, ran into, I, I told her, I said, look here, Simone Signore and Yves Montand. There they were, you know, so that that's why it's, we call it grave tripping. You, know, you trip over graves and, and that's what makes it fun. It's the unexpected, you know, as, as you're looking for someone else who you want to see, lo and behold, somebody else, uh, I don't want to say it pops up there. They're not going to pop up, but, uh, but they're still <laughs> pop up. Well, if they pop up, yeah, listen, yeah. you're on your own because I'm out of there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I get that. Definitely. I, I wanted to talk about what you said before. There's not about a ghoulish sort of a no, not really natural a thing. We're two history buffs. And, and we um, want to pay respects yeah. to the people that interest yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. And so we feel a closeness when we are, are at their grave because you can obviously, we can't go up to them in person. We can't shake their hand, but we can visit their gravesite, visit their remains. And as a sort of like a way of shaking hands, we, we always touch the stone. Yeah. Touch the stone with yeah. their name yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm the same way. And uh, people know me, all my friends, my family know that I, I will never let a good old cemetery go. I got to go in and look around for me, even if it's, you know, perhaps there's nobody famous there that I can look around and just see dates of people and picture what life was like when they lived in that area. But when you talk about famous people, I remember the first time I went to Mount Vernon and I stood there and I saw, you know, where George Washington is, you know, interred. And I just thought to myself that he's physically, his remains are physically there. And it's as close as I can get to history with him is to be there paying my respects. So I totally get it. There's nothing morbid about this. It's history and it's paying respects. And I think that's, that's great. So what I wanted to do was to talk to you about some of the interesting things in the book. But before I do that, I wanted to ask, and maybe I'll, I'll start with Robert. Why did you write a book? Why didn't you just keep doing your hobby? What prompted you to actually write your book? Well, friends of ours had suggested to us that we took them on a, on a trip to the cemetery. I, it was Mount Auburn and two friends of ours who said, you guys are great. You guys know your history. You guys are interesting. 
And they suggested, they said, you guys have to be on television. So we tried, we thought we may have the beginnings of a show and we found a production company and we produced some videos of us visiting graves and American television, uh, PBS, wanted us to produce 13 episodes of Grave Trippers. So we were almost on television, but we couldn't do it because on PBS, on public television, you have to pay for all the production costs. And to produce 13 episodes was approximately $1 million in expenses. We couldn't raise it. So then we decided, since we're not going to be on television, let's try and write a book. And it was it took us about nine months to write the book. And well, here we are today on, on your podcast. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it was an interesting journey, you know, with the, the concept of uh, uh, Robert mentioned our friends, uh, John and Melissa Capuano came up with the idea, really, like you guys ought to do something. And then we, you know, we, we tried to do it. And then you know, raising a million dollars, I was working full time. It, it, it takes a lot of time. It would have been a funny show. And uh, the videos on our website, gravetrippers.com, were the videos that uh, PBS saw that approved us for the series. But anyway, um, you know, we decided to write the book and found a great publisher, Edward Jukowitz, who's the owner of uh, Camino Books in Philadelphia. And he embraced the idea right away, thought it was great. And uh, we were off to the races. And as Robert said, you know, we completed it in nine months. It came out um, in the month of October, by the way, close to Halloween. You know, it's been going well ever since. But, you know, as I said, we, uh, the, the creators of Grave Trippers were uh, John and Melissa Capuano said, you know, you two guys uh, had to do something. So anyway, that's how it all came about. Terrific. That's good, because I'm glad we have this book. So I'm going to mention a few of the stories in here, the graves that are uh, in, in your book, which uh, were of particular interest to me. There's so many people just have to get the book. But one of the people in there is somebody I've, I've always been interested in his story although he's got a very unfortunate story, and that is General George Custer. And I would like to ask maybe Vince, if you could tell us about his grave, where it is, and just a bit about his story. Yes, his grave is located actually right here on the East Coast, uh, surprisingly. What's left of him, which is unfortunately wasn't a lot, is at West Point Cemetery. And I think that's the appropriate place for him, uh, his grave to be. He has a very impressive monument. And Robert and I are looking forward to going there uh, with our friends, uh, Bob and Patrice Martin in November, because it's been closed because of the pandemic. Uh, we, I, the last time we were there was I took the photos for the book, but it was a quick in and out. But the, the, what's great about the West Point Cemetery is you really don't need a map. It's so small. You just walk around, you see Custer, you see uh, General Norman Schwarzkopf, you see um, Winfield Scott, Edward Young, uh, who was the first man to walk in space. And he's right next to Gothels, who built, uh, who's an engineer and built the Gothels Bridge. But you just walk around and it's, it's a neat place. And there's only one tomb in the cemetery. I really, it's kind of, that's kind of a little bit morbid, but it's, it's an old fashioned tomb of a general by the name of, are you ready for this? Egbert Veal. Say that three times fast. Egbert Veal, Egbert Veal, Egbert Veal. And he was an engineer. He was a brigadier general. And his, his tomb is like the old, I guess, medieval tombs where the sarcophagus of he and his wife are in the middle with their bodies, Likeness. uh, likenesses uh, on top. And the story goes, this is an interesting story, and uh, that he was afraid of being entombed alive. And he had a buzzer installed in his casket that if he woke up or whatever he would press the buzzer and the, the cadets would always uh, like buzz it and get the guy from the guardhouse going down and finally after 20 years they disconnected it i think the guy's dead <laughs> but it, it's a fascinating cemetery i really you know the last time i was there robert was and it was our i went there with bob martin and he we, we were just walking around and um and, and taking the pictures, again, we were in a type uh, frame, but it's just walking around the sense of history. And, and Custer's grave is smack. Getting back to Custer, I digressed a little bit. His grave with the impressive monument, and it's probably the biggest monument in the cemetery, deservedly so, is smack dab in the middle. So it's almost like a, a point of reference of where to navigate. Yeah, that's where he ended up. And I think it's very appropriate that he, uh, being a West Point graduate, obviously, that he, he enshrined there. And that's what he is. Yeah. Yeah. 
For some of those who may not know, General Custer was related to the famous or infamous Custer's Last Stand, which was back in 1876 at Little Bighorn, where he and his 7th Cavalry, I think it was, were basically annihilated by the Native American tribes, wiped out. And he was initially buried out there, I believe, and then was transferred to West Point. Right. Yeah. Yes. So another one. Now, this one is for you, Robert, if you wouldn't mind. This is Helen Keller. Helen Keller is somebody who is a very inspirational person from early on in the 20th century to mid 20th century. Could you tell us about her grave? Helen Keller is is entombed within the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Helen Keller was uh, an inspiration to the disabled. Vincent and I, we were both moved when we were kids, when we first saw The Miracle Worker, which starred Patty Duke and Anne Bancroft in the roles of Helen Keller and her teacher, Anne Sullivan. Helen Keller had scarlet fever, which caused it to, she, she lost her hearing and she was blind. Mm. And her family, her parents, the Kellers, they, happened, they knew Alexander Graham Bell and Bell pointed them in the direction of the Perkins Institute for the Disabled. And they, and make a long story short, they hired Ann Sullivan to be her instructor. And through Ann Sullivan, she learned how to read. She learned how to communicate. She later learned how to speak. And she became the first blind and deaf person to earn a college degree. She later became a speaker. She wrote 12 books, including her autobiography. And she is now, she is interred. Her ashes are interred at National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., along with her teacher, Ann Sullivan, and later her subsequent secretary, a lady by the name of Mary Thompson. Their ashes are in a crypt in the cathedral. And the picture in our book of the grave marker is very rare. I have looked, I tried tried to find it on the internet, can't find it. So if you want to see a rare headstone or, or marker, Look at the Helen Keller in our book, the picture that, that's there. Well, I just want to add one thing. I just uh, I was the one who took that photo. And the, the people at the Washington Cathedral were exceptionally nice in, in cooperating. Uh, Admiral Dewey was there, Woodrow Wilson. But uh, and I'll tell you a little bit of grave tripping, too. We had always seen downstairs in the National Cathedral, there was a plaque to her that said, uh, the ashes of uh, Helen Keller are entombed in the columbarium behind this gate. So we never really saw it. But when I, I called, I asked for permission. They got uh, one of the, the deacons or what I forget the exact name. But when he, we first went into the columbarium, we couldn't find her. It was kind of weird. It's like, are you sure we got the right place? Uh, but then he, he went back and he came back. And uh, sure enough, it was right at the entrance at the foot. So we never really saw it. But uh, I saw there was... Senator Stuart Symington from Missouri there, uh, who was a presidential candidate in 1960 for the nomination. And lo and behold, it was something that I, I, I could never figure out because Woodrow Wilson is entombed in the nave of the cathedral. And I said, well, gee, I wonder where his wife is, because she, a lot of people thought she ran the country while he was uh, suffering the stroke. So there I see toward the right, there were several niches, not, not for ashes, but caskets. And there it was, Edith Bowling Wilson. I couldn't believe it. Talk about grave tripping. She was she's buried beneath uh, Woodrow because I always thought maybe they you know he's on top. They go maybe they put her on top. I don't know. But uh, yeah, she's below. I never knew that and would never have found that out uh, if I hadn't um, sought out uh, Helen Keller for the book. So another grave tripping story. <laughs> it is. So you you set out to find one thing and you find another. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, the photographs are fantastic in this book as well. I mean, I. It gives you that visual to go along with the story. If you have a mental picture of what it looks like, along with the directions, of course, it makes it that much easier to spot it. Yeah. And I had no idea that Helen Keller was interred with her two instructors. Yeah. I remember the Patty Duke movie from way back. That's got to be early 60s. I think you're right. Yeah. 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 So I want to go to you again, Robert, on another 
grave. It's in Kensico Cemetery in Westchester County, New York. Lou Gehrig, famous baseball player. Famous Iron Man of baseball. He, he played in 2,130 consecutive games. That was a record that stood for a long time until Cal Ripken of the Baltimore Orioles broke it. I don't remember the year, but Lou Gehrig's consecutive games played stood for a long time, many years. And one of the fun facts of Lou Gehrig is going to another movie, The Pride of the Yankees, which starred Gary Cooper as Lou Gehrig. Mm-hmm. That movie ends with him giving that famous farewell speech. And the movie leaves the impression that his last sentence was, today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Well, a fun fact is, is that that was his second sentence and the entire speech was not recorded video wise. Just that little clip of him saying, I consider myself the, the luckiest man in the world. That's all that exists of that speech. So that's a fun fact. Well, you know, he's, uh, let me jump in for a second. He's, he was cremated and he's there along with the ashes of his wife in the tombstone. It's kind of a unique uh, situation. Usually you're in a columbarium or whatever, but his cremated remains are, are in the tombstone with his wife and his parents, uh, mother and dad, are interred beside him in the ground. And I, I, I don't know whether or not they were cremated. So he's surrounded by his family, his wife and his parents. I've got one here now. This one really fascinated me because I'd never heard of this person before. But there was a, a magician buried at Woodlawn Cemetery by the name of Alexander Herman. And the reason why I picked him as one of the ones I wanted to ask you about is because I read that he had some sort of a magic act where yeah. he caught a bullet in his teeth. That is correct. <laughs> a little bit of background on him. He was probably, the not probably, he was the most famous magician in the world in the late uh, 19th century, performed uh, with, with presidents. And his famous trick, which you just mentioned, was catching a bullet in his teeth. And uh, his wife, Adelaide Herman, was always nervous when he performed the trick. And as a matter of fact, one of his other assistants was a man by the name of Bill Robinson, who later changed his name to Chung Ling Su. He had a magic act, and he went by the name of Chung Ling Su. The feature of his act was the bullet catching trick. Unfortunately, in 1918, while well, he was performing in London, it went awry, and uh, he was killed. Oh, no. He didn't switch the bullets in time. Okay. And one of his assistants uh, didn't put the dummy bullet in and he was killed. He was killed. Now, Alexander Herman was not killed. And he was a very interesting character, very, uh, uh, had a Mephistelian uh, look with the goatee and the long uh, a mustache. And, but he was a very kind person, very generous with people, visited hospital. He was the first performer to visit Sing Sing prison. And uh, he died very young. He died 50 at the age of 52. But he had an opulent lifestyle. He had a mansion in Whitestone, New York. And he had a, he had a yacht, which he named. Are you ready for this? He named his yacht the Fra Diavolo. This guy was a character. He had just done a performance in Rochester for uh, this traveling troupe of, uh, of actors. Uh, and he, they had no money to get back. He paid for their transportation on the train going back. And Unfortunately, on the train going back, he suffered a failed heart attack, and he died at the age of 52. And his, his resting place was something Robert and I always wanted to seek out at Woodlawn. And Woodlawn does a very, very good job of uh, preserving and cleaning up monuments. When we first saw his monument, uh, where his, his wife is buried next to him and, uh, and, uh, and her mother, the three of them, but it was, it was almost like black. It was, it was it just with, with the age and the soot. Um, about five or six years ago, seven, eight years ago, we go back to Woodlawn and it, it is white. Woodlawn does a magnificent job in, in, in conserving monuments and um, keeping them uh, fresh and clean. And his wife, uh, just to put a, uh, to end it, his wife, uh, after he died, took up his act with his nephew, Leon. Uh, Herman, but that only lasted two or three years. And then she and uh, Leon uh, Herman split up and she did her act for up until two years before she died. And what happened was uh, she had a lot of animals in her act. And one of her famous delusions was the, the Noah's Ark, where she had all these animals go on this, this ark and they, they all disappeared. But the animals were killed in a fire. And then after that, she just stopped and didn't want to do the act anymore. And 
Uh, she passed away, I think, in 1932, is, is interred with him. But it's it's an interesting gravesite. It really is. And uh, as I said, Little One did a very good job in, uh, shall we say, sprucing it up. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think that uh, that he was actually a inspiration for Harry Houdini? Oh, without question. Yes. Without question. Yes. And for Harry Keller, who, uh, who succeeded him, and uh, Howard Thurston. So you had Alexander Herman. Then uh, Harry Keller uh, retired in the early 20s, I think 1922. And then, and then you've got uh, uh, Howard Thurston, who went into the 40s. But uh, yeah, he was, def- he was definitely the inspiration. Yeah, I'm going to throw, uh, throw one in to you guys that I don't think I mentioned to you before. I saw that you visited the grave of somebody in the name of George Pickett, General George Pickett of Gettysburg Pickett's Charge fame. Yes. Um, would uh, I don't know, Robert, would you like to take that one? Well, George Pickett is buried in Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia. And he, as you pointed out, was the general who led the charge in Gettysburg, the, the final battle. And the battle did not go well for the Confederates. And he is not really well thought of by Confederate historians. And his grave site, it's very well maintained, but uh, you read the history of Pickett, you come away, the more you read about him, the less impressive you, you find him to be. Got it. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you guys a couple of your favorites, and I'm going to go to Vincent first. A couple of my favorites are, and I'll try and really condense it, is uh, another Gettysburg, uh, I don't know if you want to call him a hero or vet- uh, villain by General Daniel Sickles uh, and disobeyed General Meade's orders and nearly cost the Union forces the battle. What saved him from being court-martialed was he had his leg blown off, which, uh, and talk about a character, he later had the leg sent to the, uh, the, uh, the Army Museum with a card that said compliments of General Sickles. But this guy was, uh, he was all over the place. I think th- the most interesting thing was he served a single term in the U.S. House of Representatives and, and that single term as a congressman he introduced a resolution to award himself the Congressional Medal of Honor, and it passed. So he got himself uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor. So we had been regaled about all these Dan Sickle stories by our friend James McPherson, who graciously wrote the foreword to our book, and based on all our trips. And, and, and it was like, we, we've got to see this guy in Arlington. And he's really in a really not a well-known section, Section 3 in Arlington. You got to climb up a big hill. So when we saw that gravesite, it, was, it must have been the original stone he got planted with in, in 1914. There was nothing on it. And I was like, I was you know, taken aback because Congressional Medal of Honor winners in Arlington have uh, uh, gold leaf with the designation Congressional Medal of Honor. His had nothing. I was at, at my desk uh, that Monday. I got back and I called. I wanted to write a letter to the operations director, superintendent of Arlington, and pointed this out. And I called up to get the person's name. And she said, well, you want to talk to him? I said, really? I said, okay. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm talking to the superintendent. And I said, I uh, was at your place over the weekend. And I, I just want to point something out to you. He said, well, he's not. He's not a Congressional Medal of Honor runner. I said, he is. He's not. I said, he is. He's not we're going back and forth. And meanwhile, I hear him typing on his computer. And uh, all of a sudden he says, he is. <laughs> Got him. And he says, well, I said, I want to point something out. I said, you know, it's just the stone is like very weathered. It has no, no gold leaf. He says, well, not everybody has gold leaf. He says, Audie Murphy does not have gold leaf. I said, you know, you're right. I said, I know exactly where Audie Murphy is buried near the main monument. And I say, he doesn't have gold leaf. Why? He says, well, the family requested it. No, no gold leaf. I said, well, I'm representing the Sickles family. And I said, I think he should, he should have a uh, gold leaf. Make a long story short. It took like two other trades. He was very nice. He, he thanked me for bringing it to his attention. That, next time we went, he had a brand new stone. My God, the uh, mint condition, but no gold leaf. So I called him back. I said, you're getting close. You're getting close. But I said, you got to get gold. He finally, uh, the last trip I made with my late wife, Ginny, we saw it and I, I actually took a photo of it. I sent it over to Jim McPherson and he said the Sickles family owes you a great deal of gratitude. But he was a very uh, various character. Let's put it that way. He was involved in the disputed election of 1876 with Rutherford B. Hayes. This guy was all over the place. So, Yeah, I just want to comment one thing about General Sickles. Any boy, yeah. 
he always seemed to win, didn't he? Even when he, even yes. though he lost that battle, he lost that battle. He, he went against orders. Uh, he lost his leg, which, you know, which is terrible, right? He then got himself voted the Congressional Medal of Honor. Yeah. Okay. I know he was a prominent figure at the 1913 reunion of Gettysburg. Yes. He was. Yes. Yes, he was. Yes. Yep. And then you, a hundred years and more after his death, came along and got him this beautiful new tombstone. So he wins again. Yeah, you know, he had, a, he had, he had an impressive funeral at St. Patrick's Cathedral, officiated by then Cardinal Farley. So this guy, you're right. That's a very good point, James. He, he won, he won, he won, he won, he won. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a little side note. I have a, an ancestor, who a great-great-grandfather, who fought in the Civil War. And uh, I always heard some stories about him. He went in as a drummer boy. And wow. then, um, but it was, it was late in the war and they couldn't afford a drummer boy. So they put him right into the infantry. He was only in one month, just a little over a month before Appomattox. But in that time, he actually participated in the battle of Petersburg. Oh, wow. We were yeah. there. I want to get there uh, definitely oh, someday. Yeah. So what happened was he was in, and of course he did a lot of garrison duty and stuff afterward, but he had some disabilities during that time and he got a pension for oh, wow. a lot of years um, and he was only in a few months. Right. So he, he kind of leveraged that somewhat. I mean, yeah, he, he saw a lot of stuff obviously, and he, he was disturbed by it, but, but what happened was he, so he got this pension for many, many, many years after only being in, in battle a short amount of time. And then the, the funny thing about a cemetery, we went to, to visit his grave and we were looking around for his grave and we saw the, the grave of his daughter and son-in-law. I think it was a beautiful headstone. I said, this thing's beautiful. I wonder where he is. So I look around the back of the headstone and there's one of those civil war bronze markers in the ground. So he, he died, I guess, after his daughter and son-in-law and he had, they had his name etched on the other side of their tombstone. Yeah, that's 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 not unusual. A lot of people do that. Believe it or not, it's kind of uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I did, but it, it kind of fooled us. I guess that's one of those things that you don't realize. <laughs> we thought he was just trying to save money. Who knows? No, no yeah. comment. Now, there's a name that many people probably haven't heard of. I know this was the name sounds somewhat familiar, but I wasn't sure who it was. But I know this is one of your favorites. Vincent, and that's Harry Frizee. Quick story. We were at Kensico Cemetery, same cemetery where Lou Gehrig is, and I uh, was there with uh, Robert and my late wife, Ginny, and our friends, the Martins, and we were looking for the tomb, a very opulent tomb, I might add, of uh, Jacob Rupert, who was the owner of the, uh, the New York Yankees. And we're, we're, we're just walking up this hill, and uh, all of a sudden, I see this very impressive above-ground sarcophagus, a picture of which is in our book, and it says Harry Frazee. And I'm like, I'm in a state of shock. I'm going, Harry Frazee? And, and everyone, Harry Frazee. I said, everybody's looking at me like I'm, like I'm a man from Mars. Who's Harry Frazee? I said, Harry Frazee was the owner of the Boston Red Sox who sold Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees, and the guy he sold it to is at the bottom of the hill. It, it was just like incredible, you know, and, um, and he's not on the map of Kensico. He's not, you know, when they give you the map of the luminaries and, you know, Jacob Rupert, the tomb is there, but uh, Harry Frizee is not on the map at Kensico and he should definitely be on the map. So tell me, do you remember at all when Harry passed away, had Babe Ruth really begun to shine as a star with the Yankees at that time? Yeah, yeah he passed away actually, uh, Frizee, relatively young. He uh, died of uh, Bright's disease, uh, kidney. Oh, yeah, kidney, yeah. He was a very heavy drinker, really heavy drinker. But he, he was a Broadway impresario. And the reason he sold Babe Ruth is he needed money to keep his Broadway shows going. And to answer your question, yes, by, by the time he passed away, he was, uh, Babe Ruth was on the map in more ways than one. Yikes. So he, he lived to regret it. I, I guess so. Maybe that's why he started drinking heavily. Who knows? It could, be. <laughs> it could be. So Robert, back to you. This question's for you. There's another interesting section in there about a president or former president by the name of John Tyler. Can you tell us about him and his grave? John Tyler is buried in Hollywood Cemetery, Richmond, Virginia. He is one of two and a half presidents buried in that cemetery. Also buried there is James Monroe 
and I have a president, I, it's the Confederate president, Jefferson Davis. John Tyler, for people who, who love presidential history, will recognize the jingle, Tippecanoe and Tyler too. That it was the campaign slogan in essence in 1840, when William, and, William Henry Harrison and John Tyler were elected as president and vice president. Harrison died 31 days later. He was inaugurated on March 4th, 1841. And on April 4th, 1841, William Henry Harrison died. And John Tyler was the first president to succeed upon the death of the president. The Constitution is a bit nebulous in its wording as to how the vice president takes over. Some people had interpreted that the vice president remains the vice president, but he is an acting president. John Tyler said, no, he made sure he took the presidential oath of office as soon as Harrison died. And so because of Tyler, that tradition is held today that upon the death of the president, the vice president becomes automatically the president. And there's no, uh, he's not an acting president. He is the full president of the United States. And John Tyler, because he was the first president to succeed the office, his nickname became his accidency. Ouch. <laughs> and he had a very dogmatic personality in the sense that he was very much of the Woodrow Wilson mode, my way or the highway. His first political party was the Democratic Party. He bickered with them and he quit the Democratic Party and he joined the, the then newly formed Whig Party. And that was the party with which he and Harrison were elected. But he, he didn't even get along with the Whigs. The Whigs started the first, the very first impeachment proceedings against the president. The resolution didn't pass, so there were no articles of impeachment. So you could see Tyler, it would have helped if Tyler had read How to Win Friends and Influence People because <laughs> <laughs> he turned a lot of people off. And so he's a character and we, we owe him a, a, a bit of thanks as to, to the succession of, of the vice president in case the president leaves office or dies. Right. There was no precedence. I mean, no, nobody knew what to do, really. I mean, it's the first time. I mean, it must have been very difficult on him. What does his grave look like? It's, it's impressive. He has a bust. You see a bust of his. It's a very high uh, yeah. obelisk type. So I'll put it this way. If you if you visit it, you can't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> You're also very near uh, Monroe. He and Monroe are uh, 10, 15 feet of each other. And Monroe's uh, tomb is known as the birdcage because it's very opulent. It was, uh, it's, it's like a birdcage. And you know what? Tyler's headstone was finally went up for a lot of years. He, he was on an unmarked grave. That's how little he was thought of. And then he did have a headstone, uh, which is in our good friend, uh, Louis Pacone's book, uh, Death of a President, uh, the original headstone, which was okay. But then Congress appropriated, I believe in the, the 1915, 1917, appropriated $15,000, which in that time was a lot of money, uh, to put on a significant, not headstone, but monument. And that's what exists today. As Robert said, uh, it's got his uh, bust of his. And, uh, but if you want to see uh, his original uh, tombstone, you got to get Louis Pacone's book. Uh, as a plug for our friend. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I, I have actually interviewed Louis Pacone for our podcast, and I have read two out of his three books, and I plan on reading his third. But uh, Louis does a great job researching. Oh, my gosh. One of the things I do remember, though, is that when you talked about James Monroe being buried down in Virginia in the same cemetery, in Hollywood Cemetery with John Tyler. I understand that James Monroe actually died where you guys live in New York City. Yeah, he did. He died on Crosby Street on July 4th, 1831. Uh, he was living with his daughter, was in ill health, and he was buried for a lot of years in Marble Cemetery, in a vault uh, downtown in Marble Cemetery. And in 1858, the Commonwealth of Virginia wanted his remains back. And uh, again, this is before the Civil War. So they exhumed him 
and took him on a barge uh, down to uh, Hollywood Cemetery, which was then just getting started. He might have been, and I, 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 I'm not sure, he might have been the very first celebrity burial in, in Hollywood Cemetery. But it was a, a big ceremony, governor, uh, a lot of officials, and it was, it was a big to-do. But you're right, he died, he died in, in New York City on Crosby Street downtown. So James Monroe, he had two resting places then, yes. New York and Virginia. Wow. Yes, Robert, you want to add to that? Uh, this is point out that he, was, he died on July 4th, so he's the third president to die on that day. He died five years after both Jefferson and John Adams passed away on July 4th, 1826. So that's quite a distinction that we have three presidents, literally three founding fathers who died on the 4th of July. That is incredible. I think so many people know about the Adams-Jefferson coincidence, but I don't think too many people know that James Monroe also died on July 4th. And I think we also had a president, Calvin Coolidge, who was born on July 4th. Correct. Yes. yes. Okay, Robert. Yes, sir. We talked before about West Point, and uh, we talked about General Custer. There is another person who has a memorial at West Point, who I understand is not, she's not actually buried there, but this person is called Margaret Corbin. And this one really struck me too when I read it because I thought it was fascinating. Could you tell us who Margaret Corbin was? Margaret Corbin was probably America's first female military hero. And it, her heroics took place at the American Revolution. There's really not much written about her as far as a, a life story, other than she was born in Pennsylvania. She married a, a farmer by the name of John Corbin, who, who himself was a patriot also. He enlisted in the army to fight for America's independence. He, he was stationed at Fort Washington with George Washington himself. And when the British invaded Northern New York at the Battle of Fort Washington, Washington was in retreat. Washington safely got away to White Plains and John Corbin, he was part of a garrison who served to try to repel the British forces. His wife, Margaret, was by his side, believe it or not, because she was a nurse. Mm -hmm. so she could attend to him or to any injured soldier. And during the battle, he manned a small cannon. And during the Battle of Fort Washington, he was killed by, and he was shot. And if you can imagine being Margaret Corbin, you see your husband being shot dead, but she, she did not panic. She took up the gun herself. She saw how John Corbin loaded the, the, the cannon and she continued to fire the cannon, but eventually she was hit severely and she was taken prisoner. And because of the severity of her wounds, the British let her go. But the American Congress was so impressed by her heroics, they awarded her half of a soldier's pay for the duration of the war. So in essence, she became the first female to receive a military pension. So I think Margaret Corbin, I wish our name was more recognized, but that's one of the reasons why we wrote the book. So someone like Margaret Corbin would be read about. Absolutely. Margaret Corbin, I, I was a history major in college, like you, uh, Vincent. I loved history. I've read a lot of history. And I don't remember ever reading about Margaret Corbin. I've heard of Molly Pitcher. I know the story of Molly Pitcher, but Margaret Corbin. And there's a monument at West Point. Again, we were talking about how small it is, but what, right when you walk in, it's right there. Can't miss it. Very impressive, too. She got her just due. In 19... 26, I believe, the Daughters of the American Revolution had what they thought had her grave exhumed, or at least they thought it was her grave. And so it wasn't until 2017 that through DNA testing and they looked at the photographs of the, the skeletal remains, it was determined that they did not have Margaret Corbin's remains. So unfortunately, uh, her final resting place is still, it's unknown. Maybe they'll find it someday. I hope they do. But as for now, 
the stone, which was meant to be her tombstone, now stands as a, as a memorial for her in West Point, New York. Well, definitely, that's uh, that's some place that I would like to pay my respect sometime, and I'd like to really learn more about her. She deserves so much, and I'm glad there is some recognition. I want to ask you, Vincent. What did you want to really accomplish by writing this book? What's your what's your main goal? What do you want the reader to come away with? It's basically, as I mentioned, I might have mentioned before, an introduction to our hobby. We're both history enthusiasts, and we wanted we wanted to introduce people to the fun. Now you mentioned it was a fun book. It's fun looking for these people because when when like you mentioned also seeing uh, George Washington's uh, tomb, Robert and I had the same effect. When we were at uh, Mount Vernon, it was like, oh my gosh, two feet away are, are, is is the remains of George Washington. It was just, it just hits you. So the, the purpose of the book was to uh, tell people about this hobby, which uh, it seems a lot of people are embracing lately. With a lot of cemeteries doing tours, Greenwood uh, does tours, a Woodlawn does trolley tours. So a lot of people are starting to explore cemeteries, and we wanted to. You don't have to go on a tour, and sometimes the best tour is when you go yourself. And uh, we, we had gone to Woodlawn uh, about a year and a half ago with our friends, the Martins, and we checked out 15 graves within a couple of hours. Of course, we had a great navigator and Patrice. But along the way, another grave tripping thing, we, had, we were passing a corner and I see, I don't even know if you know this guy's name, Frank Leslie. Frank Leslie ran a newspaper uh, in, the, in the late 19th century called Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper. Really? Yeah. And I go like, wow, he's, again, he wasn't on our list. But that's what makes it fun. And uh, that was the purpose of the book, to introduce people to a, a fun activity, we think, of paying homage to uh, historically notable people. That's great. And again, it is so readable. Uh, there's so much information packed into a book that you can sort of keep it almost as a reference. Our publisher, Edward Jukowitz, made a very, we thought, very bright move in making a paperback because you could just... You just slip it in your backpack when you're going on a trip and it's easy to it's easy to peruse. So it's a great guide. And uh, we, we hope we accomplished our objective. Everybody likes detective stories and stuff like that. And part of what you guys did was was a, as detectives. And that's really cool. Yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. Now, I want to ask you this, Robert. I'll start with you, Robert. What's next for you guys? Well, a project that we are considering doing is for a possible Grave Trippers Part 2 book. And the title of the, the working title of the book is Remembering and Respecting America's Heroes and Heroines. So I want to do more about the, the Margaret Corbins of America and the heroes also. Uh, we're going to cover not just military, but in entertainment, sports. So that's what we are planning at this at this juncture. Terrific, terrific. And Vincent, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think it's a it's a it. <laughs> I was going to say brilliant concept, but you know, like I pat myself on the back here. But, <laughs> but uh, people like Margaret Corbin and Mabel Fairbanks. We found out we actually didn't see her grave at Hollywood Forever Cemetery because we didn't know about her. We found out that Fairbanks was a, a leading uh, black ice skater who uh, encountered an incredible amount of prejudice, just learning how to skate. She had to buy a, uh, she had no money. She bought a, a secondhand pair of skates that there were two sizes too big, stuck cotton in them. And here's the thing. She became very famous. She uh, was in a lot of shows touring around and she became a trainer of Olympic athletes and she trained Olympic medal winner, Ty Babylonia. So it's people like that, uh, like Fairbanks, who are heroes in their own way. I mean, she just persisted and persisted and persisted. And, and people don't know about her. We didn't until about a year ago. And uh, I, I think it's that along with famous people, too. I was suggesting to Robert, maybe uh, a president, President Chester Allen Arthur, who uh, prior to his assuming the presidency was a, a, the machine politician par excellence. And then when he became president, he assumed the presidency after the death of James Garfield, he just said, goodbye, have a nice day. I'm going to be Mr. Reform. And that took a lot of guts. That took a lot of guts. And he just abandoned his, uh, what, what brought him there. And he just, he set about uh, 
you know, doing the right thing. Okay. So there, there are plenty of people like that. And, uh, and heroics doesn't have to necessarily be a sporting yeah. event or saving somebody's life. It could be if you were a very charitable person. I consider that heroic. If we proceed, so uh, we shall see who will be included, but that will be the idea, the theme of the book, recognizing heroism in America. In all its forms. Excellent. I can't wait for that book to come out. And it's been a lot of fun talking about cemeteries. So how can people get a hold of your book, Grave Trippers, History at Our Feet? Well, very simple. You can go on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. Uh, we're also uh, on Kindle. Or you can go to the Camino Books website, CaminoBooks.com. Well, that's terrific. And again, I highly recommend the book. I'm going to share it with some other people so that they can they can get their copy and uh, start their searching as well. I know a few history buffs like myself, so I'm going to share the secret of your book. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and to our listeners. Spread the word. Gentlemen, I want to thank you both for being on our show, for all the work that you've done in this book and for all the work that you're going to be doing in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Very much appreciated. Okay, guys, have a great day. We'll talk to you guys soon, all right? Yes. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well, and God bless.